water now. Oh, no. <laughs> well, this is like crazy golf. Throughout the world of sport, the game of golf is admired for its honesty, integrity and sportsmanship, but sometimes those qualities are not enough to prevent the odd mistake. Everyone who plays the game should endeavour to know and understand the rules of golf. The Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St Andrews, along with the United States Golf Associations, are the guardians of the rules of the game. For this video I'm joined by David Rickman, Rules Secretary of the RNA, responsible for the coordination of the work of the Rules Committee. And by PGA European Tour's Chief Referee John Paramore, one of the most familiar faces on the tour. I really cannot, the, moment. the first thing any golfer needs to do is to make sure they're playing with clubs and ball that conform with RNA standards. And once you have the right equipment, the appropriate clothing and footwear, you're ready to head to the first tee. But there's just one other thing you might need and you should never be without. The rules book. It's when you head out onto the golf course that real rules problems can arise, even for the world's greatest players. They aren't immune to the odd mistake. So for the next hour or so, in the company of John, David, plus my colleague Steve Beddo, we're going to see what you can learn from some of the mistakes and situations that have cropped up in professional golf. There were plenty of thunderous looks from American Paul Azinger after he broke his putter on the ninth green during the 1996 Open Championship. If a club is damaged or broken except in the normal course of play, which relates to making a stroke, a practice swing or practice stroke, it can't be used or replaced for the rest of the round. So if you want to avoid the embarrassment of putting with a sand wedge, as well as the cost of a new club, take a deep breath and remember it's only a game. When Wayne Riley snapped his club at Loch Lomond, he wasn't quite so glum. I thought it was a pretty good shot. <laughs> Perhaps the Australian was a little happier knowing that as he'd broken his club playing a shot, he could repair or replace it. We've seen what happens if players damage their clubs. What happens if a ball gets damaged or is out of shape? If a player thinks their ball is unfit for play, i.e. visibly cut, cracked or out of shape, uh, the player is permitted to mark and lift that ball, examine it, but you must give your opponent or fellow competitor an opportunity to observe the lifting, to observe the ball. If the ball is unfit for play, it may be replaced. Well, assuming you can keep all your equipment in shape, the next thing you've got to do is keep the ball on the golf course. When Greg Norman's drive strayed offline at Wentworth during the world match play, he found his ball lying amongst the many TV cables that snake around the course during a televised tournament. The Australian was perfectly entitled to move the cables, which are movable obstructions, and the leaves, which are loose impediments. But he had the added problem that his ball lay very close to the out-of-bounds line. With his ball lying inbounds, Norman was allowed to take his stance with his feet out of bounds. I put his head. Uh... <laughs> oh, it obviously didn't affect his concentration, as he played a marvelous recovery shot. When Joachim Hagman's tee shot drifted way off course at Cron Montana in Switzerland, he was hoping it was still in bounds. But as John Paramore made his way to the scene, fellow competitor Colin Montgomery wasn't quite so sure. There's no line. There's somebody's bloody guard. I agree with it. Although Hagman's ball appeared to be way outside the bounds of the course, one of the boundary stakes seemed to have been removed making it difficult to ascertain the exact line of the boundary. Well, it has to be marked out. That's the big thing, isn't it? With play grinding to a halt, it was up to the referee to convince the Swede that his ball was actually out of bounds, despite the lack of a boundary stake. 
I agree. Then you're probably going to question. Oh, yeah. everywhere we go. No, I agree with you. But how many times do we play around the boundaries around house? We do. We, we do quite often. Sweden, Jarmo Sandelin wasn't the first player to ask for divine intervention, playing the 17th at St Andrews. But with his ball resting right next to the wall beyond the famous road hole, he had to rely on his own skill during the 1996 Alfred Dunhill Cup. Because the wall defined the boundary of the course, Sandlin was not entitled to free relief and decided to play his ball where it lay. Not that it seemed to bother him too much. The question of provisional balls has often baffled even the pros, as Ben Crenshaw demonstrated on the very same hole. He thinks his first tee shot has gone out of bounds and plays a second ball without declaring it a provisional. I hit my first tee shot. I assumed, I assumed that it was out of bounds and I didn't see anybody lay the flag. Uh, and I did not announce it. But with his first ball actually inbounds and with two balls now in good positions, Crenshaw was unsure which one he should play. You can, you can, <coughs> can you proceed and play both? No. You can't. You can't. You want to have the turn and direct again? Because Ben okay? had failed to declare that his second tee shot was a provisional ball, he'd put another ball into play. And he now had to play that ball, despite the fact that his original shot was inbounds. The flag waver may have been unable to see the shot, but Crenshaw's mistake meant that he was now playing his fourth rather than his second shot. A great recovery, but on one of the hardest holes in golf, a double bogey, inevitable. I get confused sometimes. Can you declare a ball loss when you're standing on the tee if you fit your tee shot into the trees? You can actually perform actions to make that ball loss, but you can't physically declare a ball loss. You can put another ball into play under the rules by saying nothing. And uh, you probably saw in the Crenshaw case there, because he didn't declare it was a provisional ball, he was putting another ball into play, so therefore he was three off the tee. However, if you hit a provisional ball, um, the original ball is not lost until uh, either a five-minute period has expired, or you play that provisional ball from a point past where the original ball is likely to be, or indeed you find that the original ball is out of bounds. Assuming you can keep your ball in bounds, the basics are play the ball as it lies and the course as you find it. It's a fact of life for golfers that your ball is not always going to end up where you want it to be, even if you're a seasoned professional. Playing the ball as it lies often calls for a little bit of improvisation, although most of us wouldn't be able to pull off this sort of miracle shot. Seve at the Longcom Trophy, bringing San Nom to its knees. Perhaps the most extreme example of playing the ball as it lies came from Bernhard Langer at Fulford in 1981 when a delicate touch and a head for heights was required. I think what's happening is that Mark is um, asking if he can have the bunker wrecked because from the road, if he overshot, which is uh, quite a possibility, if he goes in that bunker, there's some very nasty um, footmarks. So uh, he would prefer the bunker to be raked. The principle of playing the course as you find it can assist players on occasion, particularly when the lie of the ball, line of play or extension of that line is worsened by someone other than their player, his partner or caddy after the player's ball has come to rest. Mark James entitled to have the bunker raked, although in the end his fears unfounded. When Mike McLean pulled aside a trailing creeper from immediately behind his ball during the final round of the 1992 Dutch Open, it would be the most expensive mistake of his golfing career. He thought it was a loose impediment, but the creeper was alive, fixed and growing, and therefore by improving his lie, he was breaking the rules. His recovery shot from the rough helped him into what he thought was a winning position on the leaderboard. But when officials took him to the TV compound to show him his mistake, he had to add a two-shot penalty to his score, relegating him from first place. It could have been even worse if he'd signed his scorecard without adding the penalty strokes 
and the mistake was discovered before the competition closed, he would have been disqualified. This incident in Phoenix, Arizona, involving Tiger Woods, is a good illustration of the importance of knowing the rules, particularly the definitions. Having called for a ruling, he was told that the boulder was by definition a loose impediment and could be moved. The only problem was how. Woods might be the most athletic player in the game, but even he wasn't up to moving a ton of granite on his own. But where Tiger walks, a big crowd always follows, and on this occasion, they were able to provide more direct help than their usual shouts of encouragement. The boulder wasn't embedded in the ground, but was lying on top of the sand, which meant that it fitted the bill as a loose impediment, although perhaps the heaviest in the history of the game. And with his line of play now clear of boulders, Woods was able to play his shot unhindered, and eventually card a birdie on the par five. Well, I can remember the Mike McLean incident, that was an unusual one. He actually thought he'd won the tournament. That's right, Ken. It was uh, a bizarre set of circumstances. A camera crew, had, while rehearsing, had picked up this bit of footage of, of Michael moving the creeper. And unfortunately, you know, he, he thought he'd won the golf tournament, only to find out just a couple of minutes later that in, he'd, he'd incurred a two-shot penalty and had gone from winner to joint third. The other one I, I'd love is the, the boulder with Tiger Woods, because you could never believe you could move it out of the way. Yes, if only you could play golf with that many <laughs> friends walking around with you. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was, it was uh, a case where there were a lot of people around and uh, he was free to use them under the rules to uh, assist him move the boulder. So the, but the boulder wasn't embedded, it was just deemed to be lying on the top of the ground? That's right, it, it, it was not embedded and that was one of the crucial aspects in, in its determination from a rules perspective as a loose impediment, albeit a heavy <laughs> loose impediment. Uh, but we do have a decision in our decisions book that already clarifies that, that a large stone is by definition a loose impediment and therefore if you can move it, albeit with the assistance of in this case some spectators, um, then that is permitted under the rules. Well ideally it's best to play the ball as it lies, but occasionally it's almost impossible to do that. Ireland's Philip Walton found his ball in a terrible lie at the 1991 French Open. He decided to try and play it rather than declare the ball unplayable and take a penalty drop. And that decision eventually cost him dear. The player is the sole judge of whether or not his ball is playable. And except when the ball lies in a water hazard, players are entitled to declare a ball unplayable at any time. One of the skills of the game is choosing the right moment to make that call. You're tossing that umbrella. When American Paul Azinger found himself in thick gorse bushes during his final round at the 2000 Open at St Andrews, he sensibly decided to declare his ball unplayable. The situation was complicated by the fact that Azinger's provisional ball had also finished in the gorse bushes. But once his original ball had been properly identified, he was allowed to drop back, keeping the position where his ball originally lay directly in line with the flagstick. The decision to take a drop may have cost Azinger a penalty stroke, but trying to play from the bushes could have led to an even worse situation. Plug balls in bunkers are a tough prospect, even for top pros. And when they're lodged beneath a steep bunker face, the problem becomes even harder, as Catherine Marshall discovered to her cost at the Millennium Women's British Open. With the ball all but buried, Marshall decided to call for a rules official to clarify her options under the unplayable ball rule. Can I mark it in the After advice as to her options, she decided to declare her ball unplayable and drop it in the bunker within two club lengths of where it lay, not nearer the hole. Marshall then wanted to know if she had to mark the position of the ball and physically measure the two club lengths or whether she could simply pick the ball up and drop it in a position that was obviously within the two clubs length distance. No, two the official confirmed that the dropping area doesn't always have to be measured 
provided the ball is dropped in the right place. With the ball's original position clearly noted by the plug mark, the recommendation that the original position of the ball is marked before being lifted wasn't necessary. Dropping from shoulder height, the lie of the ball would still be less than perfect. But at least now well away from the face, she was able to play for the green. Probably the most common ruling is the unplayable lie ruling, David. Yes, you can declare your ball unplayable anywhere on the course outside of a water hazard. If your ball lies in a bunker, then two of your options require you to drop the ball in that bunker, either back on a line keeping the point where the ball uh, lay directly in line with the flagstick, or within two club lengths of where the ball lay. Both of those options, as I say, you must drop it in the bunker. Otherwise, you can go back to where you last played from. Uh, if your ball doesn't lie in a bunker, then obviously those three options, uh, hopefully one of those, will give you uh, somewhere that you can play from. Those are your three options you have, each under penalty of one stroke. Even if you find a decent lie in the bunkers, that's not necessarily the end of your problems. The most recent example of dangers of bunkers came at the Millennium Open, when American David Duval elected to play his ball from below the steep face of the road bunker rather than declaring it unplayable and dropping further back in the bunker. It went from bad to worse. Indeed, a costly finish. <coughs> Australia's Mike Harwood found himself in a similar situation during the 1993 Open Championship at Royal St George's. To drop it as an unplayable ball, you have to drop it in the hazard. In the bunker as an unplayable ball. But if he declares it unplayable, surely he can drop it out of the hazard. Well, it? You've got several choices as an unplayable ball. He had two immediate problems the position of the ball and how he would get to it. Ron, are you going to enjoy raking this? The wooden railway sleepers which form the bunker face have been declared integral parts of the course by the championship committee. Therefore the ball had to be played as it laid or declared unplayable. Okay. Drop in the, can I drop it anywhere in the bunker? Well if I drop it here and it rolls all the way back down, do I have to drop it here again? Having established that he was not allowed to declare the ball unplayable and drop outside of the bunker, except if he were to go back to the tee, Harwood decided that his best option was to chip his ball into a more playable position. I mean, how is the caddy, or how is the guy going to break the bunker? The Australian was then able to play out, narrowly avoiding another bunker and leaving himself still a long way to go and another tricky shot. But if Harwood thought he was having problems, they were nothing compared with those of the man with the rake who followed in his footsteps. <laughs> Gary Player is known as one of the greatest bunker players of all time but even the legendary South African has to find his ball before he can play it. The rules allow a player to search for his ball buried in the sand by probing or raking, but if the ball is moved it must be replaced and recovered so that only a small part of it is visible. By not doing so, player incurred a two-stroke penalty. Let me ask you this, if I declare this unplayable... You have to drop it in the bunker though. You have to drop it in the bunker? Yes. But a difficult lie wasn't player's only problem. I don't see my uh, uh, John, John. I don't see my my dots on the seven. But even if I play the wrong ball, no you know penalty, right? Right. You better come around here, if you will. Playing the wrong ball from outside a hazard would result in a two-stroke penalty in stroke play. But while in the bunker. 
player must play the ball he thinks is his and then identify it, lifting, if necessary, once he's played it out of the hazard. If he subsequently finds that he's played the wrong ball, he would have to resume the search for his original ball. When Tiger Woods found himself in the greenside bunker at the 1997 Open Championship at Royal Troon, few were expecting him to pop it straight across the green and into another bunker. But his situation in the second bunker was complicated by the fact that his ball was lying next to that of fellow competitor Bernhard Langer. Langer asked Woods to mark and lift his ball because it interfered with his play. Langer played first and his stroke affected the area where Woods had to replace his ball. Under the eagle eye of John Paramore, Woods was then required to have the original lie recreated. The bunker was raked and the piece of shell which appeared was removed before Woods replaced his ball. Final result was an adventurous par on his first hole as a professional at the Open Championship. John, what are the basic principles if you go into a, a bunker? Well, there's a few things obviously you can't do, Ken. I think most people know that you can't touch the sand in a bunker, you know, at a dress. You can't test the condition of the hazard. And you can't move loose impediments inside um, a, a bunker or, or a water hazard. Um, but a strange thing happened to me um, recently, and I was playing with my, my young son, teenage son, and we were playing in a competition, and uh, both of our balls were in the same bunker. And some way away, and nowhere near our, our line of play, was the rake, and my son, being a, a nice chap that he is, he went and got the rake. Uh, but unfortunately he sadly raked a, an errant footprint which had been left by another player and, um, and I had to tell him uh, at that stage that he incurred a two-shot penalty for testing the condition of the hazard. Unfortunately he didn't speak to me for the rest of the round. <laughs> so the basic principle is you mustn't ground the club in the bunker. A lot of people fall foul of that, particularly novices. You can't put the club actually down on the sand. That's right, nor can you touch water in a water hazard. Well John, you mentioned water hazards and here's one or two examples of just that. At Cron Cerciere, Nick Faldo found his ball submerged in a water hazard next to the 14th green. He decided to take a risk and play the ball as it lay. It looked as if his gamble had paid off as he found the green in brilliant style. But the TV replays confirmed that Faldo had touched the water on his backswing thereby incurring a two-stroke penalty. More than a few players have been willing to get their feet wet to save a shot, but not too many have gone to the lengths that Wayne Westner displayed at the Forest of Arden. Give me a cup, sandwich. I'm full with it. With his ball resting on an island inside a water hazard, he decided that a spot of wading was called for. My hands touch the water. If the player's club touches the water, he incurs a two-stroke penalty in stroke play and loss of hole in match play, unless it was a result of falling or slipping. Therefore, if he was to disappear without trace under the water, there'd be no penalty. No, it takes it The crowds were enjoying the fun and Westner finally reached dry land. <laughs> Having found a ball, he's not entitled to lift it to identify it because the ball lies in a hazard. He's not allowed to ground his club at a dress. But if his club touches grass during a practice swing or when he addresses the ball, there's no penalty under the rules. 
As he prepared to play, the only question was, would his recovery shot be worth the soaking? A shot saved, no rules broken. And an additional few bonuses for his pains. Westner, it seemed, was not the first castaway to reach the island. No courtesy ferry, but at least he kept his shoes dry. Just gone for a swim. <laughs> Where is it? It's still in there, I suspect, yes. It looked a bit deep to me. There's immaculate stockings. Well, we'll give one more go, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to try this again. The late Payne Stewart didn't break any rules at the Belfry during the 1985 Ryder Cup, but his decision to play from the water rather than taking relief under the water hazard rule turned out to be a costly mistake. And that's three. Shot four for Payne Stewart. Yeah. He's got it out. He's there. Best he can do is a six. It always pays to make sure you know what to do in a water hazard, as Sam Torrance demonstrated when his approach shot came to rest on a bridge over a hazard during the 1998 French Open. The experienced Scotsman knew that the red stakes and lines define the margin of the lateral water hazard, and that the margins of a water hazard extend vertically upwards and downwards. This meant that the bridge, and most importantly his bore, were in the hazard. Despite this, in playing his shot from where it lay, he was permitted to ground his club on the bridge. And the result brought suitable recognition. David Guilford wasn't quite so happy after his shot from a similar position four years earlier. Oh, more trouble for him, because uh, it's not lateral there, the water hazard. He'll need to go way back round and down the fairway to play his next shot. At the B&H International Open in 1997, Colin Montgomery's approach to the Oxfordshire's 17th found a lateral water hazard. But Monty knew what to do. His ball last crossed the margin of the hazard from the Greenwood side of the lake, and he was therefore entitled to drop the ball on that side, within two club lengths of where it crossed the red line, but not nearer the hole. Due to the severe slope, the ball kept rolling back into the hazard. So Montgomery, quite correctly, after two drops, placed his ball where it first struck the ground when redropped. Now, when South Africa's Ernie Els found his ball within the margins of a lateral water hazard at the Johnny Walker Classic in Phuket, Thailand, he chose to proceed under the lateral water hazard rule. He correctly dropped his ball within two club lengths, but no nearer the hole, at the point where he estimated that his ball had crossed the red line. But just like Montgomery at the Oxfordshire, the ball rolled back into the hazard on two occasions, requiring him to place the ball at the spot where it first struck the ground when redropped. It seems with the rules, there's always something new to learn. It was an interesting incident there with David Guilford at the French Open of the National Golf Club. Uh, explain that to us. Yes, he, he, he played his ball from, from a bridge over a hazard into a different hazard. So he's now into a situation where he, he can obviously play that ball as it lies, but if he doesn't want to do that, he has two options, both under one penalty stroke. He can go back to where he last played from, would be dropping it on that bridge, which he clearly didn't uh, like the look of. Or his only other option is, is to keep the point where the ball last crossed the margin of the hazard. This was a yellow hazard, an ordinary water hazard. He's got to keep that point directly in line with the flagstick and drop behind that hazard. So he has to go all the way around to the fairway side of the hazard and uh, play again. Uh, keeping, as I say, that point directly in line with the flagstick. So he had to go back a considerable distance to play his next stroke. 
Sometimes on the tour, one ruling leads to another one, John, as in the Ernie Els case. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. We, we left him coming out of uh, a lateral water hazard for a stroke penalty, but uh, we're going to see what happens next, and that is he's dropped his ball pretty close to a cart path, and of course it leads into another ruling. Uh, so it's not always a clear-cut situation when you have these rulings. Sometimes it, it can involve two or three different rulings at the same time. With the cart path interfering with Ernie's stance, he's entitled to ask for free relief. The South African had to find the nearest point of relief, not nearer the hole, and drop his ball within one club length of that position. With the ball still obstinately insisting on rolling away after being dropped, Els was correct to place it after the second drop and carry on with his round. Now how about this? Jose Rivero's ball came to rest on a flat roof of a building during the 1992 Italian Open. He wanted relief from the raised edge of the roof, but he didn't want relief from the whole building as the nearest point of relief was in a bush. He was denied a free drop because a player cannot take relief from one part of an immovable obstruction, but not another. And after all that, he played his ball as it lay straight into a water hazard. Fellow countryman Jose Maria Olathabal faced an interesting rule situation when his ball came to rest next to a sprinkler head at Wentworth. The Spaniard would have been entitled to relief if the sprinkler head interfered with his stroke, but the rules do not provide relief from interference by a sprinkler head on a player's line of play unless a local rule is introduced. Olathabal decided that the sprinkler did not affect his swing and the resulting chip proved he was absolutely right. Arnold Palmer's ball has come to rest against a rake. Being the experienced campaigner that he is, he marks the position of the ball in case it moves when the rake is removed. This is not required in the rules, but it's a good idea, because if the ball moves, it must be replaced. It's worth saying there's no penalty if the ball moves as a direct result of moving a movable obstruction, such as a rake. In a slightly different situation, Mark Rowe at the European Open. Now his ball did move when he removed a rake. He wasn't in a bunker though. And with the aid of fellow competitor Nick Faldo, he then had to replace the ball in its original position on the sloping ground above the bunker. When Rowe was preparing to play his shot, the ball rolled down the slope and ended up in his footprint in the bunker. As he hadn't grounded his club at address, there was no penalty, but he now had to play the ball as it lay. A good recovery shot, and in circumstances like that, the only thing to do is smile. Rowe was involved in a second unusual incident concerning a movable obstruction at the 1992 Trophy Longcom. Quite how the ball managed to come to rest in such a precarious spot, only the golfing gods will know. But Rowe was calmness personified. With the help of an official, he complied perfectly with the rules of golf. As the golf cart is situated through the green, the ball must be dropped as near as possible to the spot directly under the place where the ball lay on the floor of the cart. And to make things even better, he played an excellent recovery shot and went on to win the tournament. Back at Wentworth, Nick Faldo was to encounter a similar situation where a rules official would know best. That is the break of the tournament. That was out of bounds. It's hit a tree, I'm pretty sure, and that's back in play. And I think from down the fairway, he doesn't know whether that's still in play. He may think that's gone.
It may have been a big break, but Nick Fowder was about to be faced with a rules problem. And yes, I remember it well. Ruling there, will he, will he have to play it off the shopping bag? It's not an integral part no, of the he's, course. He's, he's got to move the bag. And <laughs> I pay me money to get in, I'm not moving. And he marks it with the, uh, the tea peg. Just drift back a little bit further, please. <laughs> now, should the ball be dropped or placed? <laughs> Powder seems sure, but is he right? Huh? Why? I mark, I mark the exact spot. Doesn't matter. It, it's on a movable obstruction. When you're doing it like that, you have to drop it. Well, I'd marked the exact spot where it was. I knew exactly where it was. It doesn't matter. If you know exactly where it is, you, you place it. No, you, you drop it in this. Are you sure? Don't hold it. The official was, in fact, quite correct in advising Faldo to drop his ball rather than place it. If you can mark the ball in the exact spot, you place it in the exact spot. Well, you couldn't see the exact spot before the profound Of course I can there. see the exact spot, because I put the piece of paper, the bag was there, and I put the, the ball was there on the bag, and I put the tea peg exactly there. Doesn't matter, you have to drop it. Jeez. Right, you're the, I, I presume if you're wrong, nobody else can overrule it, can they? If you're wrong, yeah. if you are wrong, yes. it cannot be overruled, can it? Yeah. Not easy to stand up to a six foot three major title winner. But after the recovery shot, even Faldo would have been pleased with the result. What are the basic principles with obstructions then? Yes, obstructions are artificial objects and they're either movable or immovable. And because they're not natural to the golf course, a player is entitled to relief, either by moving the movable obstruction or by moving the ball away from an immovable obstruction. So a movable obstruction is, is deemed under the rules to be one which you can move without unreasonable effort, without undue delay and without causing damage. Plastic bag in the Nick Faldo case is a, is a good example of that. If your ball lies by an immovable obstruction, then the player has to determine his nearest point of relief, not his nicest point of relief, the, the nearest point of relief where if he was to play the stroke that he would have played, so it's the same club, same direction of play, same swing, same stance. Uh, if he was to play that stroke, where on the course is the nearest position to where the ball currently lies for him to do that? Now, that may be in a, a good lie, that may be in a bad lie. This is why we talk about it being the nearest point of relief, not the nicest. Once you've got that point, you've got a one club length area not near the hole in which you can drop the ball if you so wish. But as we've seen with Jose Rivero, if you don't like the relief option, you can, of course, play the ball as it lies. We've already said that you should play the course as you find it, but sometimes you don't always find the course as you'd expect to find it. The term fair weather golfer certainly wouldn't apply to Bernhard Langer at the wintry Oxfordshire course. And golfers often have to face weather conditions that can change the characteristics of a course. Though fortunately, they seldom reach such extremities as to turn the fairway into a river. Flooded bunkers are a more common occurrence, and Mike Clayton gave a perfect illustration of how to deal with such a situation at Saint Pierre. With complete relief available inside the bunker, Clayton chose to take free relief and drop the ball in the bunker. Alternatively, he could have dropped the ball behind the bunker under penalty of one stroke. He needed to ascertain which was the nearest point of relief not nearer the hole. Having done so, he dropped within one club length of that point, with no penalty. But it's not always weather that causes abnormal ground conditions. On the final hole of the 1994 Volvo Masters, 
Seve Ballester has found his ball in a rather nasty place at the base of a tree, close to a large hole. The Spaniard was convinced that the hole was made by a burrowing animal, and he felt that his ball was lying in earth which had been removed by whatever had dug the hole. If that had been the case, he would have been entitled to free relief, which would have incidentally made his next shot much easier. The official, however, wasn't quite so sure, and in front of a very interested Spanish gallery, John Paramore was called to make the decision. Was the hole the result of a burrowing animal or not? But I really cannot, at the moment, find ev any evidence to positively <laughs> tell me this is made by a burrowing animal, which it has to be. Well, it must be I think, I think this is made by a burrowing animal. I can understand that. With Colin Montgomery waiting to play his shot, the final decision was not what Seve wanted to hear. So you made the final decision, and your final decision is not allowed to drop, right? All right. That's fine. Thank you very much. Sorry, sir. Okay. No, no, okay. Sorry. With the ruling having been given, all that Seve could now do was chip out sideways. Well, a lot of us remember Valderrama and Seve. What are your memories of it, John? Oh, Ken, it was, um, one, it was a long, long time ago, but it was the last day of the season. Uh, it was the last hole, the 72nd hole of the Volvo Masters, and Seve was uh, level with Bernard Langer. Obviously, he did have some interference from the residue from the hole, which had obviously been dug out by something. But in my own view, I, I couldn't say with all sincerity that it was made by a burrowing animal. And uh, so therefore I had to, had to rule it was just a hole, could have been made by anything. And uh, obviously he, he played the ball as, as, as it lay from behind the tree and unfortunately took five at the last hole. And Bernard Langer ended up winning the golf tournament. We all struggle at times to get the golf ball to go where we want it to. And sometimes it seems to have a mind of its own. Just as when Colin Montgomery played this tee shot at the 1996 B&H International Open. One female spectator played an unwitting but painful part in setting up a birdie chance for the Scot. The lady in question was, from a rules perspective, an outside agency. So the ball stayed where it was, and having hold the putt for a two, Monty graciously accepted his piece of good fortune, and the lady had a souvenir as well as a bump on the head to remind her of her day at the Oxfordshire. But not all deflections result in good fortune. Miguel Angel Jimenez's ball landed on a sprinkler head and rebounded into a bunker. All the Spaniard could do was accept his misfortune as rubber the green. But what happens if your ball is struck by another player's ball? That's just what happened when Jose Maria Olazabal played this approach shot to Wentworth's 18th green during the 1992 Volvo PGA Championship. For Olazabal, it was a piece of good fortune as his ball was deflected closer to the hole. But Jose Maria Canizares was bound by the rules to replace his stationary ball as close as possible to the original spot. That might not be as simple as it sounds for the amateur player, but with hundreds of pairs of eagle eyes to guide the official, Canizares' ball was placed as near as possible to where it lay before it was moved. And if we're talking moving, Oh, my goodness gracious. What's happened there is uh, Patrick's addressed the ball just as he's about to start his backswing. He's got a little forward press, and the ball's moved. So he's, what he has to do now is he has to replace the ball and then play it with a one-shot penalty. If he fails to do that, he, he would actually incur a two-shot penalty. So uh, I'm sure he'll call an official over, but what a bad break for... Uh, Padraig Harrington there, his second shot's only travelled one inch. They say that golf forces you to accept the rough with the smooth, but on occasions like this, the rough can be very difficult to accept. But when has a ball moved? Well, yes, but part of its ball certainly wobbles as he addresses it during the 1994 Open Championship. It's not left its original position and come to rest in any other place, 
The official definition in the rules book, the Swede didn't occur a penalty and went on to finish runner-up behind Nick Price. There were ball problems for Price himself at St Andrews as windy conditions made life on the Greens treacherous during the 1994 Dunhill Cup. The Zimbabwean did not ground his putter and thereby addressed the ball, knowing that if the ball moved after he'd done so, he would incur a penalty stroke. The unfamiliar routine may have put him off. But the real exasperation came when he tried to mark his ball. Well, yeah. I think myself that ball had been marked. I think the ball had been marked uh, and then it moved. I would, I would say that he was safe enough. But after some discussion with the official, it was agreed that whilst Price had marked the ball before it moved, that was irrelevant. The ball remained in play and it had to be played from its new position without penalty. And when you thought you'd seen just about everything in golf, you have to think again. American Steve Lowry was a happy man when he found the iron and green at the 17th hole at Sawgrass, but he hadn't reckoned on the intervention of a maternal seagull trying to rescue what she thought was an egg. But Lowry needn't have worried. The rules allowed him to substitute another ball and place it as near as possible to where it originally lay to set up, yes, you've guessed it, a birdie putt. Well, it was a fairly unusual incident with the seagull. How do you make rules up for th unforeseen things? Certainly there are occasions that, that happen in professional events and, and in amateur golf events throughout the world which are almost unimaginable. Trying to separate the hypothetical from the, uh, those cases in reality is at times difficult. And that is our ultimate challenge as, as rule makers, to try and establish a, a simple set of rules, a fair set of rules, but, but ones that do cover as best we can the sorts of cases that uh, can emerge uh, anywhere people play golf. So uh, our challenge going forward is to uh, find a simple but fair code and we describe that as our elusive rainbow. Well you might think on a nice calm day once you find the putting green things would be plain sailing but it's not always the case. The Valley of Sin in front of the 18th green of St Andrews held few worries for Nick Faldo as he chipped in for a two to complete his first round of the 1990 Open Championship. Or did he? The ball is only hold when it's entirely below the level of the lip of the hole. In this instance, it took a while, but the ball fell into the hole of its own accord, just as Nick approached. When Angel Cabrera's ball stopped on the very edge of the hole, it seemed to hang there for an eternity. But it was, in fact, just five seconds before it fell in. No penalty stroke for Cabrera, and smiles all round for the Argentinian. It was a different story, however, for Sam Torrance at the English Open, when having putted for an eagle too, his ball performed a similar gravity-defying feat. The rules allow the player enough time to reach the hole without unreasonable delay, plus an extra 10 seconds to determine whether the ball is at rest. If the ball falls into the hole after this deadline has passed, he must add a penalty stroke to his score. And on this occasion, Sam was guilty of waiting a little too long. <laughs> Sam might have been smiling, but not for long. His eagle two was in fact a birdie three. More than one player has incurred penalty strokes through sheer frustration on the greens. England's Mark Rowe incurred a two-stroke penalty for hitting the ball while it was still moving at the European Open. 
and confirmation the ruling absolutely right, even in slow motion. Perhaps even worse is losing a shot when you hadn't even intended hitting the ball. Davis Love was the unfortunate player to hit his ball on his practice stroke at the 1997 TPC. With the ball having been accidentally moved by Love, he should have replaced it in its original position with a one-shot penalty. By not doing so, he doubled that penalty. And unfortunately, Love's error was not spotted until after he'd returned his scorecard and he was disqualified for signing for a score that was lower than actually taken at the 17th. It's not unknown for a player to miss the ball completely, but few air shots have ever been as costly as Halo wins at the 1983 Open. At the end of the championship, he finished just one stroke behind Tom Watson. And finally, here's the ultimate lesson in what not to do. Not far away. Oh, 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 oh. himself. Oh, no. And luckily for Mike Clayton, no penalty for the thoughts running through his mind. Well, if you're going to break the rules, you might as well break all of them. Poor old Mike Clayton there. <laughs> yes, uh, really, was he playing golf or some <laughs> other sport? One really doesn't know with Mike on that occasion. Yeah, we've had one or two people suggest that perhaps he was testing the surface of the green, but we thought that was, uh, that was a bit <laughs> of an exaggeration. So he gets one stroke penalty for causing the ball to move. No penalty for the ball hitting him. Um, so one stroke penalty, replace the ball. Um, but perhaps... Uh, the greatest penalty of all is that uh, he will now be forever remembered for this particular incident. Originally there were just 13 rules of golf, now there are 34. It doesn't matter where you play or what golf course you play on, you play under the same rules. Yes, that's right. 250 years on, much has changed uh, from the time of the original code. But, but the important principles remain the same. Play the ball as it lies, play the course as you find it. If you can't do those things, do what is fair. So those fundamental principles remain the same, as does the principle that, that it is essentially a self-regulating game, that golfers are required to apply the rules fairly themselves, and if that means uh, penalty situations, well, um, that's what they must do. And the pros, John? Well, apart from having a, a pretty large staff at each event uh, of referees, we have just as many penalties that the players call upon themselves rather than those which are imposed by us. So, uh, it's, as David says, a self-regulating game. It's a game that uh, we've all grown up playing in the right spirit, I feel, and uh, a very, very special game. John, thanks very much. David, thank you. Most enjoyable and very informative. So remember, whatever standard of golf you are, the most important piece of equipment could well be the rules of golf.